Uh, this is less than time already, and uh, I hope everybody got a, a handout. Now, just let me be honest with you about something. The further we get into the history here, okay, the less we're going to be looking at direct verses, because there's there aren't as many to look at, which is why I spent so much time in the first nine, eight studies trying to really drill down a foundation from, that we were going to use for the rest of the class. Because if you don't understand those fundamental issues, you're going to have, you're going to be lost. I mean, it's going to be a real uh, hard time for you in the rest of the study. So what we're going to look at today is I'm going to give you an overview of what's called the patristic period from about 100 to 300 to 315. Now, last Sunday, we, we talked about from the death of Paul to the apostolic fathers, okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of pick it up in that, in that same uh, general vicinity as far as um, where we're at with the history. Now, one of the things that we, and th this is kind of what we're talking about, all right? From about 300 all the way till about 3, 315, 312-ish in here with Constantine, which we'll have to talk about um, in a little bit more detail when, when we get to that point. But up here on the top, you have sort of the, uh, the so-called fathers, okay, the church fathers. And down here, you have different events that are going on. Now, Marcion, we'll talk about him next week. We'll talk about the canon next week. And down here, you also have a couple Roman emperors. But this is roughly the about 315 years, or 215 years, that we're gonna, that we're gonna overview today. And then the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at a couple specific issues that are occurring within that, that time. Now, I'm going to be frank with you. We don't have time to talk about everything, okay? We don't have time to talk about everybody, everything, every movement, every little minute detail that we could discuss. We don't have time to do that, or we'd never get done with this, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm picking what I perceive to be the most significant, important topics in each era to cover that have the most impact on what we're trying to do big picture, okay? So that being said, we've discussed a lot, now to your notes, we've discussed at length the lack of historical evidence that exists between the end of the Acts period and about the middle of the second century, okay? Now, within that, within that space of time, within that time period where there's not a lot of extra biblical historical evidence, is a, it's significant We've talked already about how 2 Timothy informs that period about what's going on, about how the church entered into apostasy. We studied the names of those men there in 2 Timothy to study the nature of how the apostasy would occur. We've done all of that stuff. But within this vacuum of, of information, so to speak, it's important because here um, is when you're going to have some specific views of church history develop based on how different groups view this time period. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you look at the point here, Mark Noel, author of Turning Points, Decisive Moments in the History of Christianity, suggests that when, when historians reflect back on the era of darkness, the era of darkness that we've been talking about, the Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant views of church history begin to develop. Okay. So here's what I'm saying to you. Because there is not a lot of evidence when modern church historians, whether they are Roman Catholic, whether they are Orthodox, or whether they are some form of Protestant, look back on this time period, they tend to read into this their own ways of thinking theologically. Okay? That's kind of what I'm trying to say. So, within this time period, um, you know, his, let me read this. Responsible historians, Christians or not, try to base their accounts of the early church as securely as possible on the best available evidence. But as we said, yet precisely because that evidence is so sparse, the standpoint of historians, that is the systems of belief and assumptions that historians bring to their tasks, bring a most important factor to the interpretations of early Christian history. So that's just a fancy way of saying what I already told you. Roman Catholics tend to view this era through their doctrine, their Catholic doctrine. Orthodox Christians tend to view this era through their Orthodox doctrine, and Protestants tend to view it obviously through, through what they perceive to be correct. Okay, So what Mark Knoll is saying is that the Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant interpretations of early Christian history hinge 
on the basic assumptions of each theological system concerning the way in which God guides the church. So what we've seen again is that with, with about roughly 70 AD with the close of, this is actually after the close of the Acts period, from there through till about, let's just say 150 AD, there's this dark period where there's not a lot of evidence. Okay? How Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestant think theologically, okay, tends to give them their viewpoint or what they're going to say about this time period. Does that make sense? Now, th there's a few reasons why that's important, okay, and I want to spend just a few minutes talking about each, each one of those three views, okay? Now, from the Catholic view, the belief in the apostolic origin of church tradition and the apostolic character of the bishop's office, and we're going to talk way more about this in a later lesson, means that Catholic interpretations of, early, of the early church are likely to see a more central, more positive role for the actions of the early bishops in constructing the institutions, organizing the sacred writings, and guiding the worship of believers. Okay? Now, two things that you have to understand about Roman Catholics. They believe in what is called apostolic succession. Okay? That Peter, is, according to Catholic doctrine, we'll, and we'll study this in more detail later on, that Peter is the first pope of the Roman church. Okay? And that the, the, the apostles appointed men to be bishops that would succeed them. So what the Catholics believe is that there is an unbroken chain of what is called apostolic succession going all the way back to the apostles. Okay? And that the church, the institutions of the church, the sacraments of the church, the teaching of the church, the canon of the church was all committed to these, to these bishops and this succession of bishops. Okay? So the Catholic view of this time period is going to have a favorable view on the formation of institutions. Okay. Now, what have we already seen about institutions in our study so far? According to the Bible, what's the only, if you even want to call it an institution, I don't really even like the word, but what is the only organization that was ever founded and established in the Word of God? The local church. The local church. Okay. And we studied the, the, the nature of the local church. That it was to have a multiplicity of, of elders and deacons. That there was supposed to be these in every city and every church and so on and so forth. So when the Roman Catholics look back on this time period, they tend to view it favorably in the emergence of some of these doctrines. Okay, Now we will study those in a little bit more detail in a, in a, in a future study. But if you have any questions, stop me and, and ask. This is a big thing for Catholics. When, it, when if you get into a conversation with a Catholic, they will they will go straight to this idea of apostolic succession, because they have a nice, neat system that they've developed that traces the authority of these bishops all the way back to Peter and the boys. Okay. Now, when you look at it from Scripture, you, you don't you don't see that. All right. The second view is the Orthodox view sees God's guidance of the church through organic processes of worship, liturgy, and corporate actions. It means that orthodox interpretations of the early church are likely to see common patterns of prayer, gradually evolving habits in New Testament churches, and consensus growing up around creedal statements as the crucial shapers of early Christian history. So the Catholics, they view the institution Okay? They view the apostolic succession. What the Orthodox people are big about are the creeds of the faith. Now the Catholics are into the creeds too, but the Orthodox a little bit even more so than that. That what shapes what Christians should be believing and how they should be practicing is these creedal statements that are developed that, that demonstrate what they should believe and how they should practice. Okay. Now the third view, general view, is the Protestant view. And the Protestant, the Protestant belief in sola scriptura, or scripture alone, along with Protestant suspicion of human institutions means that Protestant interpretations of the early church are likely to stress the foundational role of the New Testament writings and be more willing than either Catholics or Orthodox to find flaws 
in early church practices or decisions. Now, I'm going to be straight up frank with you. That's where I'm at. Okay? And I'm, I'm even going a step further than that. I'm going a step further than that and saying to you that if you don't evaluate the early church from the viewpoint of Pauline theology and doctrine, that is the correct way to view it. Okay? So that's even taking it a step further than most Protestants would be willing to go. But Protestants by nature view what as the main authority? They say that. Modern Protestants say that that's what they do. Whether they do or not is probably another, another discussion. Okay? But therefore, Protestants are going to be much more willing to see flaws, errors, and mistakes in judgment, in thinking, in decision making, and in belief than what Catholics or Orthodox are going to be willing to do coming out of this time period. Now let's face it, now why would that be? Do the Catholics have to have this system with an infallible truth that's being passed on through? So they, they by default, they cannot be critical of what's going on in this time period. Because if they are, it would not reflect well for their overarching viewpoint of apostolic succession. Okay? I don't believe in apostolic succession. The Bible doesn't teach apostolic succession. Okay? But, so therefore, we, I can look at it and I can be more critical and I can see they departed the pattern here, they departed the pattern here, 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 and here, whatever those areas might be, and you can evaluate them not from a hierarchical structure that's been put in place, but based on what? The Bible and Scripture alone. Okay? Does that make sense to you? So there's three, out of, out of this period right here is where we're going to get three different views. The three different views of the church are going to emerge out of that time period. Okay? And our view, the Pauline view, would be another subset probably of Protestant. Pretty much all that stuff I would agree. Scripture is the final authority. Okay? Um, we should be, if we're going to judge the actions of the early church based on Scripture, then there's obviously going to be, a, then we will definitely find flaws and things that were not done the way they should have been done. Okay? And why do we know that? Because I've already showed you from the verses in 2 Timothy that all the churches in Asia had already what? Forsaken. Forsaken Paul. So they had already begun to leave the path. So we, you see why we laid that foundation the way that we did there? Because if we didn't, then we come to this. If I had just jumped in with this stuff first, you would have had no context to understand it from. Okay? Now, all that being said, while I agree with the Protestant perspective articulated by Noel, it is still incomplete. Because it fails to take into account 2 Timothy as a handbook on apostasy of the New Testament church. Okay? So... We got to go even a step further than the average Protestant would go because what we view as correct, accurate, and in, in, in proper practice for the churches today is what Paul taught, set up, and established in the local churches when he went out. And we've already seen that that pattern was very soon uh, departed from. Okay. Now before we get into the next point, does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. When, when you say that orthodox, is that, I mean, what comes to my mind is the like Greek orthodox? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. Within, within Christendom, there are essentially three groups within Christendom. There's, Cat, there's Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. Okay. Now, within, under Protestant, okay, got you got Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, blah, 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 on and on down the list. Okay. Well, all of those groups here consider themselves what? Protestant. Protestant. Mm -hmm. All right. So within Christendom, within Christianity at large, you have set these three big groups, and then this one has a ton of different subgroups. Okay. Any other questions about any of that? Okay. So naming the time period. Church, church historians have offered various titles to describe the time period between 100 and 315 A.D. Okay. The term patristic, the term patristic comes from the Latin word uh, pater, or father, and it designates both the period of the church fathers and the distinctive ideas which came to develop within this period. So the reason we call it the patristic period is that's a word to describe that this is the period of the church what? The so-called church fathers, okay? 
That, that's that's kind of where the, the title and the term comes from. According to Alistair McGrath, the patristic period is vaguely identified as the period from around 100 AD to the Council of uh, Chaldeon in 451 AD. Now, you'll notice that I cut it off at 315 in the notes at the beginning of the lesson. And there's a reason for that, because there's a major shift that occurs once Constantine supposedly becomes a believer. Okay, and we will spend we will have to spend a lot of time talking about that. Generally speaking, there are three classifications of church fathers. Okay? There's the anti-Nicene anti fathers, and these are the church fathers that lived and wrote before the Council of Nicaea in 325. Okay? There are the Nicene fathers, and these are the ones that are living contemporary with the Council of Nicaea. And then you have what's called the post-Nicene fathers, or those living after the Council of Nicaea. Okay? So generally speaking, if you're going to look at the church fathers, they're going to break them up into those three general groupings. Live, those living before Nicaea, those living contemporary with Nicaea, and those living after Nicaea. Now, Bruce Shelley, author of Christianity, Christian history, Church History in Plain Language, offers an alternative title, okay, uh, for the period between 103 312 AD. He calls it the Age of Catholic Christianity. Okay? Now there's a reason why he does that. He says that this is the period in which Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire and probably east to Asia, and Christians realized that they were part of a rapidly expanding movement. They called it Catholic. This suggested that it was universal in spite of pagan ridicule and Roman persecutions, and it was the true faith in opposition to all perversions of Jesus' teaching. To face the challenges of their times, Christians turn increasingly to their bishops for spiritual leadership. Catholic Christianity, therefore, was marked by a universal vision by Orthodox beliefs and Episcopal Church government. Now what that is saying to you folks is that, what does the term Catholic mean? Universal. Universal. Now what did we already say about the church, the body of Christ? Universal. Are all of us today part of the universal church of the body of Christ? Yes. yes. If we put faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. Okay? We are. We've been baptized into the church of the body of Christ, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and other verses. Okay? Does the Bible ever use that term? No. No. This is a term that comes into play and into usage during this era between 100 and 312. Okay? And it is used to describe the emergence of a particular church with its companion system. All right? So when Bruce Shelley looks at 100 to, 3, to 312, he views it as that the main focus of the time period here is that what's happening is the emergence of the Catholic structure, which is why he calls it the age of Catholic Christianity. Okay? Okay. Uh, so whether you want to call it the patristic period, with the age of the fathers or whatever, that, that certainly uh, would be, from my perspective, appropriate term to use. Or another one that I give you that I might use interchangeably is, is the age of Catholic Christianity. Now, in the age of Catholic Christianity, again, is this Catholic Christianity that's emerging the correct view of doctrine, belief, and how the church should live, function, and conduct its affairs? No. No. And how do we know that? Again, we know that because we've already studied the fact in the Word of God that they were already departing from the pattern while Paul was still alive. Okay? But you have to understand that this, this is important because even to this day, if you get into a discussion with a Catholic, they will always try to take you back to this idea of apostolic succession and authority being established in a succession of bishops that are appointed by the apostles. Okay? Any questions about that? I gotta be honest with you, I mean, I, I don't... Whoops. What happened here? If you look at the notes, I don't really like calling the period the age of Catholic Christianity. I don't like to use that term because what it's telling you is that the church 
already abandoned the pattern within the first 150 years. While I don't like calling the time period the age of Catholic Christianity, there's little doubt that the ecclesiastical monster known to history as the Roman Catholic Church has its roots in this time period. By the time, three weeks from now, by the time we get done surveying this time period, you will have clearly done, I will have clearly demonstrated to you, using the church fathers in their own words, without, so you can decide for yourself, okay, exactly what's going on here. Exactly what's going on in relationship to the canon of Scripture. Exactly what's going on to the evolution and the emergence of the Catholic Church and structure and the preeminence of the bishop. And exactly what is going on with the idea of a sacramentalism that can only be administered by a Roman Catholic clergy. Yeah. Did the apostles really appoint, as they claim, did they appoint the bishops, the apostles? Or the disciples that were left, or come with me to Acts 20. It's a good question. Get Acts 14 in one hand, and Acts 20 in the other. <laughs> Acts 14 in one hand. Get that one first. Go to Acts chapter 14, verse 23. See, you, you got to be careful with this, Beverly, because it goes, it goes, it goes awry real early. Okay, verse 23, Acts 14, 23. And when they had ordained them elders, again, singular or plural, plural, in every what? Okay. So again. Did Paul ordain a plurality or a multiplicity of elders in every church? Yes. yes. Okay. That was one of the steps that we studied already. That when he went out to to, to uh, when he went out on his apostolic journeys, he followed that pattern, right, of evangelization, edification, um, establishment, and then he would then we, he would enlist men and appoint them to these positions, and then he would leave. And when he left, he turned it over to who? Yeah. To them, go to Acts 20. Um, Brian? Yeah. In that verse, they, is that Paul and. It's Paul and uh, Barnabas. Okay. Acts 20, verse. Well, for the sake of time, verse 30. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you, to warn every one night and day with tears. Now, just so you're clear on who he's talking to, go back up to verse um, 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the what? The elders, singular or plural? Plural of the church of Ephesus. Okay? So who's he meeting with in Acts 20 where we were just reading in verse uh, 30 and 31? He's meeting with the Ephesian elders. Okay? Now look at verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are what? Sanctified. Did Paul say to these guys, okay, now what you guys have to do is you have to appoint the next generation and, and establish an apostolic succession. Or he, he, he turned the thing over to who? To them, for them to what? Run on their what? Own. Okay? There is no mention in the Word of God about establishing a chain or a hierarchy of which apostolic authority is going to be passed on. The job of that is accomplished by what? The Word of God. Right? What does Paul say? Oh, here's another one, Beverly. I just thought of this. Come to 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3. If a man, 
uh, chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man be appointed to the office of a bishop by an apostle. No. Is that what it said? It said, if a man desire the office of a what? A bishop. He desire what? A good work. Who desires these offices? The individual. Okay? What God, what Paul, what God through Paul ordained is how these local churches should function. They were to have in verse 1 bishops, and then you drop down to verse um, 8, likewise must the deacons. So the two offices in the local churches that Paul established were bishop slash elder, and second was what? Deacon. And there is no passing on of apostolic authority. Okay? It does, that's not the way it worked. What did he say? He tells them in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says it's their job. There is a way, there is a method here that the truth is to be passed on. Okay? But it is not in the Catholic sense of the structure. Verse, verse 2, the th uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others what? Also. also. So it is a process that is supposed to be ongoing in the local churches where they continue to perpetuate themselves and not look to bishops, a single bishop for leadership, guidance, and determining what is correct belief and practice? They were supposed to get correct belief, belief and practice out of what? The scripture. Okay. And Any other questions about that? Yeah, they're um, like the Catholic Church, though. I mean, they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They put because if you go back in the Old Testament, that priest and their urim and the third and then all of this sets that groundwork for what they picked up, right? And, and two weeks from now, we'll talk about that. Oh. My, my, the title of my lesson two weeks from today is The Evolution of the Catholic Church. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, we're going to talk about three guys. We're going to talk about uh, Irenaeus, Ignatius, and Cyprian. And by the, time we get from, by the time we get from Ignatius to Cyprian, you'll see very clearly that Cyprian is teaching that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. Okay? Ronnie. Um, I just noticed what I think is significant when we were at Acts 20, verse 32. He commended them to God and the word of His grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's commending them over to the doctrine that He's taught them. Yeah. To, for them to continue to follow and teach sound doctrine. Yeah. And the other thing they overlook is when you were in 1 Timothy, they were to be the husband of one wife. <laughs> So they're totally they're they're accepting the or the the bishop, but they're not accepting the other things that come along with that. Exactly. Is that what you're going to say? No. Um, about the verse one in Timothy three about the bishop. So then, is the bishop? So then, are like you the bishop? Yeah. But you don't hold that title. It's just you kind of are according to scripture, but you don't. The, uh, the title of the office that it's not just me, okay? It's it's Wayne, it's Todd, it's Craig, and it's Paul. It's anybody in this church that's an elder is also called scripturally a what? A bishop. Oh, because this I kind of thought this leads to believe it's one person. Because it says if a man desires the office of a bishop. Okay, hold your hand there and go to Titus. Go to Titus. Chapter 1, verse 5. It's not saying there, um, Kathleen, that it's only one. It's saying that if you desire, only one man can hold one office. I'm one person, right? So I can never be a bishop's. No, it's singular. Okay. If a man, singular, desire the office of a bishop. Okay. First uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain what? Elders. Elders, singular or plural? Plural. Plural. Okay. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right, unruly for a bishop, must be. 
see how the, the, the scripture there in verse 5 and 7 use the word elder and bishop interchangeably? So if elders is plural, he's saying that if anyone's going to hold the position of an elder or a bishop, these are the qualifications they need to meet. So within a, the local church, there's going to be more than one elder slash bishop or bishop slash elder. Now I, for one, am not... There are guys that are going to make a, heap, a big deal and insist, these are grace guys now, that you call them bishop. I don't want you to call me. You need to, that's what the Bible, don't call me bishop. Okay? <laughs> Just call me Brian. All right? You don't. You, you start getting into that stuff and it becomes a strife of words and it just is not, it's no meaning, there's no profit in it. But that is the that is the title of the office. You see that? That there's more than one? Kind of. Okay. Now, within this time period, there are three centers of theological influence in the patristic period. The first one is Antioch. Now, as we've already seen in previous studies, it was from Antioch of Syria that Paul and Barnabas were sent westward on their missionary journeys. As the third largest city in the Roman Empire, Antioch, Antioch, the church in Antioch, exerted widespread influence throughout Syria, and by the end of the fourth century, Antioch was a city of about half a million people, and over half of it, they estimate, were Christians in the city of Antioch. The other obvious emerging center here is Rome. All right? Is Rome. At the, as the heart of the Roman Empire, the church at Rome was obviously influential. Modern historians have estimated that despite persecutions, more than 30,000 Christians lived in Rome by 250 AD. With clear spiritual ties to Paul, and notice how I say legendary ties to Peter, because we will discuss that also, the church at Rome gained the respect and admiration of Christians throughout the empire. Eventually, what's going to happen is the Bishop of Rome is going to emerge as the leader, one of the leaders of Catholic Christianity. Okay? So that's going to happen over time. It does not happen overnight. And third is the city of Alexandria, Egypt. All right? Named after Alexander the Great and located in modern Egypt, the church at Alexandria emerged as a, as a center of Christian theological education. A distinctive thought, uh, style of theology came to be associated with this city, reflecting its long-standing association with Platonic philosophy. And in the end, we will see that Alexandria became a leading center for theological and textual corruption. What happens at Alexandria, folks, is you have the first you have the first Christian seminary founded, and the first the founding of the first Christian seminary is going to be founded largely and mostly. With, between a marriage between biblical truth and Platonic, the Platonic philosophy of Plato, and the Gnostics and some other stuff. Okay, three weeks from today, the title of the lesson is Alexandria, a hotbed of corruption, because the postmillennialism, infant baptism, bat baptismal regeneration, all of these things are going to be coming out of the so-called scholars of Alexandria. Okay. Along with textual, hang on a second. As long, along with textual influence over the Word of God itself, Linda. Well, yes, that's the thing with Plato. I mean, when did he live? I mean, before B.C. He what? lived. He lived way before this. He lived when the Greeks were in power. And so his philosophy. And his philosophy, his his, his pagan. going to be intermingled with biblical stuff and. Yeah. Yep. Didn't God burn that uh, library down in Alexandria? <laughs> they lost quite a bit of stuff. Now, so a, what we want to do is we want to evaluate the church fathers that from the point of view of Scripture. Okay? It is commonly held view amongst Protestant evangelical Christians that the writings of the church fathers are the most organic and accurate interpretations of Christian Scripture and theology in existence. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. Most Protestants, even in this group right here, have the opinion and make the assumption 
that the writings of the church fathers are the, the, the that they are the earliest, most scripturally aware writings and interpretations of Christian belief, theology, and practice that exist because some of these men knew the apostles. That's what they believed. Okay? When one compares, though, the writings of the church fathers with the Pauline revelation clearly recorded in Scripture, the reality becomes vividly clear. Okay? The pace of apostasy, folks, that was already underway during Paul's lifetime quickens with the ministry of the church fathers. In short, Christendom's apostasy was, for the greater part, amplified and intensified by the early church fathers and the writings they left behind. Now, I've been saying this for a few weeks, and I'm just waiting for one of you to say, prove it. <laughs> and I'm going to prove it, trust me, over the next three weeks. Okay? I got quotes, I got quotes that I'm going to show you where they say flat out that there is no salvation outside of the waters of baptism. Is that true? No. Not today. Is that, is that, is that, is that in the Bible? Yes. Well, it is true in a way because Christ was baptized and we were baptized into Him. It's true not the way that they mean it. They mean it. They talk about a priest, a father, consecrating the water, blessing it, and then bringing salvation to the sinner by dumping the water or putting the water on their head. That's what they mean. Is that salvation? No. no. Is that justification by grace through faith without works? No. Is that for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves? Is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast? No. no. Yeah. Should part of it might come from the the misunderstanding of the term baptism, whether it be with water or without water. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in a second. Yeah. Bill Lolly? What, what would be the motive? for the church fathers to go ahead and perpetuate these inaccuracies. Unless it is, you know, Satan behind it, trying to change the program of God. It's, it's, yes. It's an attack on the truth. It's an attack on the truth. It takes away the glory of God and puts it on man. That's what it does. You know, and we'll talk about Gnosticism. How what the Gnostics believed was that was that um, spiritual things were good and matter was evil. Okay? So Jesus couldn't have been God because he had a human body. And so what the Gnostics did is they put in place a whole series of intermediaries or uh, emanations between people and God. And by the time we're done with this, what I'm going to submit to you is that that is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church has done. They have put the believer here and God over there, and you've got to climb through and jump through all their hoops and layers of authority and so forth before you even have a hope of getting to God. Right? Whether it be the cult of the saints, whether it be the sacraments, whatever it is, there's all this stuff that separates you from God in that system. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says that when you believe, Paul says that when you believe the gospel, God the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam and puts you in Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no water involved in it. There's no anything involved in it except some blood that was shed on a cross and a resurrection from the dead to prove that who he, who he said he was. Okay? And when that and that alone is believed, the believer is put into the universal body of Christ, not the Catholic Church. Okay. Now, the church fathers, last point here in the bottom, the church fathers disregarded Colossians 2.8. Why don't you go look at that? Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after who? Christ. The church fathers disregard this verse and introduce pagan Greek philosophy into the theological discussion 
rather than relying solely upon Scripture as their authority. Now, in the Bible or the church, by Sir Robert Anderson, he writes, what the Old Testament Scriptures were to the writers of the New Testament is what the writings of the Greek philosophers and the, and the cults of, of, pagan, of classic paganism were to the church fathers. It's pretty stinging rebuke, isn't it? Sir so Robert Anderson points out that the patristic fathers were the primary group of men who laid the foundation of errors upon which apostate Christendom has been built. Consider the following telling quotes from Sir Robert Anderson. Okay, I think I just included them in here, so let's read them. But on this subject, our present day theology is so far from reflecting the wisdom and knowledge of God, partakes of ignorance and the errors of the patristic theologians. Plain words, I repeat, are needed here. For the writings of the church fathers affords a vantage point or vantage ground for Romanish attacks upon the citadel of divine truth and the insidious effects of German skepticism that undermine its very foundation. What? What do you mean? What he means is, what they did is they took pagan philosophy, they, they married it together with the Word of God into a thinking system that did nothing but attack and undermine the foundational truths of the Word of God. Remember, do you guys remember our, our, uh, our cycle of Christian history? Apostasy, evangelism, uh, uh, teaching, and culture. When you get to culture, you get to where you have to make it appeal. And when you get to that point, you have to try to figure out a way to do it. And the way they did it was to take these philosophies, take the Word of God, put them together, and they ended up with something that was totally foreign to what God's Word taught. Bill? No. Oh. <laughs> it looked like you were going to say something. Pastor, um, yeah. when you think of like the emergent church and uh, some of our young pastors that are trying to be so relevant today, isn't that the same thing? They're trying to force culture to make it relevant to, and then destroy the doctrine. Destroy the doctrine. Yeah. What the truth will do is it'll, the, the truth on its own will go in and revolutionize the culture. <laughs> Just let the truth be the truth and let it do what it does. Preach it, teach it, get out of the way and let it work. Amen. Because it'll do what it's supposed to do, what God designed it to do on its own, when we get out of the way and let it, let it do its thing. Yeah? I have one more question. During this dark period, how much of the actual canon of God's Word was available to church leaders and these elders? That's my topic for next week. Okay. But I'll just, I'll just, all next week, that's what we're going to talk okay. about. But I'll right. just say, I'm just going to say all of it. But were there copies for each city, each church? The church, they, they I would, in, in, in large measure, yes. Because the church fathers in different locations by the year 200 are quoted, have quoted from every book of the 27 canonical books of the New Testament okay. by the year 200. It's already been translated. Full, complete copies of the New Testament are translated into Old Latin and Syriac by 160, containing all 27 books of the same books that you have in your canon. So, yes. Oh, i got to finish reading this point here. I forgot the second point now. Um, under the quotes there by Robert Anderson. A forgotten truth, I call it, for... Uh, for in common with the mystery truths of the distinctive Christian revelation, Sir Robert Anderson understood some things, folks, about the mystery. It was lost. So he's saying the mystery, the understanding of the mystery as a distinctive Christian truth was lost in the interval of time between the apostolic age and the era of the patristic theologians. And our standard theology is so dominated by the writing of the fathers that it is still untouched by the light of evangelical revival. So Robert Anderson understood the mystery, folks, and he understood that the, the mystery truth, the distinctive revelation and message given to the Apostle Paul was lost in that period right there. And when it was lost, the whole thing went out the door with it. Okay? So, the far-reaching influence of the patristic fathers is felt in modern times. 
the unique message, ministry, and apostleship of Paul is not mentioned in modern catechism classes or mainline denominational literature. And here's why. Because it is not found in the traditional writings of the church fathers. So what they will say to you and me is that you guys have invented a new system of theology by John Nelson Darby in the 1800s. And the reason they say that is they say, you can't show me that in the writings of the fathers. See what I'm saying? And the reason you can't is because the fathers had already abandoned that stuff before they wrote. And it's been in the New Testament ever since the New Testament was written. So, the reason Pauline truth is not tolerated in modern denominational circles is because it breaks with tradition. In the end, even the Protestants, which scream so loudly for the final authority of Scripture, base much of their doctrine on practice, on traditions, that date back to the church fathers. You see that? Modern replacement theology. What's replacement theology? That we are spiritual what? Israel. Israel. That the body of Christ has replaced Israel, that all of Israel's blessings and promises and so on and so forth are now applying and are in force and in effect for who? Uh, the body of Christ. Is that a common doctrine? Yes. Modern replacement theology is a prime example of how tradition continues to cloud the theological viewpoint of modern evangelicals. Consider the following examples here. Look at this note. It is noteworthy that while the writers of the New Testament, I think I forgot a word there, uh, one and all were men who, like Timothy, had known the Hebrew Scriptures from infancy. The patristic theologians were converts from paganism, and having regard to their comparative want of acquaintance with the Old Testament, it is not strange, perhaps, that in the then condition of the Jewish people, crushed apparently beyond hope of recovery by the judgments that had overwhelmed them, the belief prevailed that God has cast away His people forever, whom He foreknow, and foreknew an Old Testament prophecy related to the future glory of Israel was spiritualized to mean the present glory of the church. you got to understand, these guys, when they got saved, they were not getting saved out of Judaism that had an a, a old uh, reference and affinity to the scriptures of the Old Testament. They were getting saved out of paganism. And so then when they go look at Israel and they see the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and they see all this stuff, they, they conclude God's done with Israel and we must be the new one. Israel. So they take all of that stuff and they apply it to who? Us. Us. That's what the church fathers do. They don't. That, that is the significance, folks, of what Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.15 when he says all they that be in Asia have what? Forsaken me. Now, watch this. Once this mistaken notion that the, that the church is Israel, is what I'm talking about, was assimilated into Christian thought, it became logical to assume that since God was forever finished with Israel, that the church must be spiritual Israel. As a result, all of Israel's promises were spiritualized and applied to the church, the body of Christ. Okay. I hope you see the main point I'm trying to get you to see. The reason we be in the mess we be in is because of these fathers to a large degree. Essentially, folks, there are two ways in which false teaching, teachings and traditions, uh, entered into the, the discussion. Essentially, there are two ways in which false teaching crept into the teachings and traditions of Christendom. Number one, extra biblical. Okay? Extra biblical means these are beliefs that, beliefs and practices that are undeniably rooted 
in sources other than Scripture. Okay? Can I tell you that those are easy to deal with? Those are easier to deal with. Because it's easier to demonstrate where they got that from. The harder thing is the second one, extra dispensational. Extra dispensational are doctrines that are in the Bible. But were never intended to be part of the theology and practices of the present dispensation. Remember a few years ago when I taught that series of messages called The World's Most Dangerous Doctrine? And I said that the world's most dangerous doctrine was to be scriptural, but not what? Dispensational. Dispensational. And so the way we got to be in the mess we be in is by guys taking stuff, extra biblical stuff, and mixing it with extra dispensational stuff, still talking about God, still talking about Jesus, still talking about the church, and the Holy Spirit and salvation, and they're still talking about all of the stuff that sounds Christian, that sounds orthodox, that sounds legitimate, and all of these things, but they're talking about it in such a way where it has been redefined as something other than what God meant to be in effect and in force for this current dispensation of grace that we are living in. Okay? So, last point, then I'll take some questions. The most tragic impact then, folks, of the church fathers was that the body of Christ lost the glory of its present mission and purpose by becoming a hybrid, a bastard offspring of Christianity and Judaism. This mixing of pagan philosophy, Judaism, and, and Scripture results in the formation of Christendom. Okay? Are there any questions about any of that? You still can't, can't um, excuse them because they had Romans 9, 10, and 11 for Israel. They didn't believe the book. Correct. Right. They, when, when I show you the statistics of who, next week, of who these fathers are and what they're quoting, they clearly, they clearly had a Bible and they clearly knew what it said in some, in some respects, but they didn't rightly divide the Bible they had. I told you last week, remember I told you that, that Barlow, the author of one of these books I've been reading, goes back and he studies in depth the writings of the church fathers for the first 500 years of the Christian church, and it's 500 years before any of them even comment on 2 Timothy 2.15. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, the way that can be is 2 Timothy. He already told you that all they that be in Asia have what? So the, again, folks, the, the, when you, so when you see the fathers and you say, how did this happen? Paul already told you how it happened. They were already departing the pattern for the churches before the man who went out and established the churches and communicated the pattern for them was already dead. Okay? So, any, other, any questions or comments about any of that? Yes? Why do you think that I don't know. I guess this is a whole other issue too. But for God to send one man to establish all this, and then there was like there was no real follow up to make sure that that those standards stayed in place. I mean, there was Timothy and and Titus and that. But after they died out, there really wasn't anyone else campaigning for Paul's um, what he had he had set up. It just seemed like there were so many years lost. I don't know, it just seems so cute. It's because, to me, it's because the, they allowed the mechanism that God put in place to not do what it was supposed to do. And that's the local church. I mean, he, he warns them there. We just read it in Acts 20 where he says, listen, this is going to happen. Men are going to arise speaking perverse things, seeking to draw away disciples unto themselves. And even in your own midst, midst is this going to happen. So I don't view it as... I, my, my take on that, Beverly, is more showing you the pervasiveness of the rebellion of the heart of man more so than God not having mechanisms established and in place for perpetuated truth. Okay? Yeah? Um, also, I can think of lots of places, but I need a concordance to find them. 
where scripture states not to go beyond what's written, um, that what we're supposed to do is believe the word. These things are written that you might believe. Um, Peter said something about, I'm ensuring that you'll be able to know um, after my demise, um, and it's by writing. And um, I think that God's intention in all of this time is that people take him at his word. I agree. And that's another reason why what you're going to see early on is an attack on the, on the scripture itself. Because what is the primary vehicle through which these doctrines are communicated? Through the preached what? Word. Word. So this whole Bible issue is another going to be another big piece to this whole discussion. Because I'm going to show you in a couple of weeks that they're going to go right after and start attacking. We just read the verse last Sunday in 2 Corinthians, right? We are not as many which corrupt what? The Word, the word of God. And so I believe that there is, a, there is a, 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 an idea when it comes to the Scripture and an idea when it comes to the church fathers that because these guys are old and they are closest to the apostles, that they are more worthy to be believed. But what God's Word says is the exact opposite. Because the thinking of men, Beverly, would say that that would make sense. But what did Paul say in, in 1 Corinthians? He said that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the things that are wise. Right? And so the way God chooses to operate and function is in, in such a way, in such a fashion, not in line with the with the with human viewpoint the way man would do it, but in a way that would ultimately bring all the glory and honor back to who? Himself. Because man wants to steal it and take it for his own. And those that were speaking for the truth were probably so outnumbered that yes. they were just yeah. It's like they are now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. Yeah. The term uh, the church fathers, was that a term uh, that they called themselves, or was that a term that other people made up for them? Well, I'm thinking of that verse, you know, where Jesus said, don't let anyone, you know, call you father, you get one father, you father in heaven. You know, we have, all of a sudden we have the church fathers, yeah. you know. Uh, can't, I can't say for sure, but I would say that it's coming out of their usage of that first word I went over with you in the notes. Um, where'd it go? Uh, Patristic Pet coming from the word Petra or Father designates the period of the church fathers. I think eventually that, that word comes into usage as well as the word Pope. See, there's a, there's a slow unfolding of this thing. Okay? Alright, well, what, else, what are we going to look at in this study? In, in this time period, okay? Next week we're going to look at the canon of Scripture. Then we're going to look at the emergence of the, uh, the Episcopacy and the emergence of the Catholic Church. Then we're going to look at Alexandria as a hotbed of theological and textual corruption. And then this one I'm going to hold off on until we get to the next period about looking at groups who always resisted this, these movements, okay? All right, we got to quit because I got to set up for church. But I uh, appreciate you guys being attentive. Okay, next week we will start focusing on the canon of Scripture.